Hello and welcome back to Management 201. Today we're covering the last chapter of our textbook, chapter 15. And as usual, let me pull up the slides. So uh, the topic of the session is operations, quality and productivity. So we'll define what operations are and we'll talk about different operation systems and different ways that companies organize their operations. We'll talk about the importance of quality and we may touch a little bit on the notion of productivity and now you know this is obvious that productivity is essential and increasing productivity is one of the goals but uh, the the majority of the session will focus on operations and quality so first of all what do we mean by operations in the most general sense, operations is a function. So right when we talk about businesses, we talk about functions like uh, finance, marketing, HR, and operations. So operations is just one of them. So this function is concerned with transforming resource inputs into product outputs. And uh, you know, the product kind of implies that this is something tangible. Uh, this is not exactly that. Uh, when we talk about products, we look at two different types of products uh, that could be out there. It could be either a good or a tangible service, uh, a tangible product, or a service, something that's intangible. And uh, there is a recent trend that uh, most companies, even the pro tangible good companies, have started switching to services or at least some combination of goods and services. This is the product known as servitization, and this trend is actually helping a lot of uh, incumbent companies to stay afloat and to increase their profitability, because uh, it is uh, a lot easier for them to maintain good customer relationship when they provide service in addition to just tangible goods. So manufacturing operations, they deal with tangible output products, and service operations deal with intangible product services. But both of them are considered part of operations, right, as a part of this, uh, what the firm actually does. Um, there are different ways to classify operation systems uh, for companies based on the tangibility of products. We can look at goods or services as being outputs, goods obviously being tangible and services being intangible. And as I just said before, there are also different combinations of goods and services that companies may come up with. So um, I may have brought this uh, up uh, early in the semester. Uh, for instance, Rolls-Royce, right? We know this company is manufacturing of luxury cars, but they do a lot more than that. Uh, they also manufacture uh, aircraft engines. So rather than selling just engines to um, aircraft manufacturers, they started selling hours of flying time, right? As, a, uh, as an airline, you don't necessarily want to deal with all the maintenance, um, you know, ensuring quality and whatnot. What is essential to you is the amount of time that you can exploit, that you can uh, fly, right? Using the uh, planes and engines installed uh, in those planes. So to increase their, increase their success, Rolls-Royce has started selling hours of flying time, and then it is up to them to take care of all the maintenance, all the services and whatnot, so for airlines, this is definitely an improvement. Uh, it's not headache, uh, they just fly their planes and uh, someone else takes care of all the quality issues. Uh, that enables Rolls-Royce to charge their customers some premium prices. It locks those customers in using their products, which to them become essentially services. Based on operations flexibility, we may talk about uh, continuous process operation, repetitive process operations, mm -hmm. batch process operations, and individual and project process operation. Uh, what it means is that in some industries, some companies are organized in a way where they simply cannot stop their manufacturing processes, their operations. If you think about national electricity grid, 
right? So energy is produced all the time, and it is simply impossible to just stop everything for a few days. So right now with the coronavirus crisis, um, you probably know what happens to the oil prices as well. Um, for the first time in history, oil prices are actually in the negatives on some dates, which means companies, oil producing companies have to pay their customers to take their oil. And the reason is they simply cannot stop extraction they cannot do anything to, to be responsive to this crisis. So they uh, have to provide incentives to the customers to pick up the oil. Uh, some of the Russian companies are actually forced to burn their oil because they cannot sell it, but they simply cannot stop that process, right? It's continuous. Repetitive process operations, um, think about assembly line. It's, um, it's really organized around the product uh, and everything follows a pre-specified sequence. The same operations happens over and over and over and over to produce as many units of product as possible. But unlike continuous process operation, this one you can stop, this one you can restructure. It gives somewhat more flexibility. Uh, further down towards the flexibility end is the batch process operations. So here you may think about companies that use the same equipment and essentially the same inputs to produce different outputs. Mm -hmm. So if you think about uh, furniture manufacturing, uh, they can use the same equipment, uh, same wood to produce, you know, tables, desks, chairs, benches, whatever the case might be. So um, they just decide what to work on at each particular time there's definitely a lot more flexibility than uh, in car manufacturing where the entire assembly line is just structured to produce one car of one type. And then finally, individual and uh, project process operations, that's sort of the ultimate flexibility. Here, sometimes uh, the whole company can be created just to perform one specific project or there may be multiple project units within a company that simply work with one specific customer and um, deliver the product or service to the ultimate specifications. So obviously here the quantity is low, customization is very high. Based on the level of customer involvement, uh, we may talk about make to stock operations, assemble to order or make to order operations. So make the stock is something that is highly, highly standardized. If you go to Walmart, most of the product that you see there would be made to stock, right? So, uh, you know, your clothing items, uh, I don't know, paper products, anything like that. Um, you know, companies just manufacture it knowing full well that they would be able to sell it uh, when the need arises. And they know that you know the need is a kind of standard; it's persistent. So there's no real need to customize anything, and, and it's a highly, highly standard product. Assembled order uh, is also a highly standardized product that implies some form of customization. Right. So if you are a car manufacturer you probably have all those components that you can use to build different kind of cars or uh, you know different trims of the same car, but you will start manufacturing a specific variety of the product once uh, there is an order for it from your dealers or you know based on your maybe projections of the consumer demand. So uh, somewhat more flexibility, but still highly uh, standardized product. And finally, um, make to order products, uh, they imply the highest level of customer involvement. So here the customer tells you exactly what he wants or she, uh, and then you can customize the product ultimately to the customer specification. And then uh, finally, we may also classify operation systems based on resources and technology management. And primarily, we differentiate between capital intensive and labor intensive industries or companies, even within the same industry. With capital intensive ones, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of technology there, and um, 
human capital involvement is kind of low, but that uh, human capital that is involved is uh, typically highly qualified. So, um, you know, think about uh, nuclear power manufacturing. Uh, everything is automatic. Everything is, uh, you know, high tech, really high tech. And um, select few highly qualified individuals are, are doing what needs to be done. Labor intensive uh, operation systems are on the opposite end of it. So, uh, so the technology is low level and um, a lot of it is really just, uh, uh, just, just you know, human labor. So uh, think about uh, clothing manufacturing uh, who typically subcontract their manufacturing activities to low cost labor, low labor cost countries, uh, Southeast Asia. So that's precisely why, right? It, there's not much that can be automated. There's a lot of uh, labor involved in manufacturing those products. And uh, that has implications for how you design your processes and where you locate your facilities. Uh, one of the things that you have to uh, plan when uh, thinking about your operations is your capacity. So that's the amount of product an organization can produce. Sometimes, well, obviously you have to estimate the market size and whatnot, uh, but uh, sometimes you have to employ really complex uh, calculations here because uh, we all know that uh, you know, scale usually means efficiency. So if you want to be a low cost manufacturer of some product, you kind of need the scale. So you need the capacity that would allow you to mass produce items. It may turn out that you will not be able to sell all the variety of product that you manufacture. So you may have to scale down and sacrifice efficiency for the sake of effectiveness. So you have to plan your capacity really carefully. And uh, you do that uh, by paying attention to throughput stages, right? So there are four stages in uh, organizational throughput processes that you have to take into account, design, operations, sales, and service. And all of them have to go hand in hand, right? You have to design your product a specific way, you have to organize your operations uh, so that the design is uh, effectuated adequately. You have to have adequate sales force to sell what you make, but also service, right? And uh, many companies, at least in the past, uh, did not really think about service much. Uh, you guys are probably too young to remember um, back some, I don't know, 40 years ago, um, there was a car manufacturer from Eastern Europe called Hugo that was trying to sell cars in the United States. And they were cheap cars, not terribly sophisticated, uh, but the quality was kind of low. And for people who bought those cars because of the prices, um, that was actually a nightmare because the service component was not there. And so the company obviously didn't make it. So uh, we do not even, or most of us do not even remember that car brand anymore. The other thing that you have to design uh, carefully is your facility layout. Right? So whatever it is that you make, well, almost whatever, um, you're gonna have some physical presence. If you're a manufacturing facility, you have to have you know, some sort of a building where you transform inputs into outputs. You have to have a place, a warehouse where you keep your inventory. You have to manage your sales appropriately. So uh, the facility layout describes how exactly you organize operations within that facility so as to reach your strategic goals. There are four basic kinds of facility layout that we can look at. One is the product layout. Right, so here, everything is focused on the product itself. So think about assembly line. There's a uh, specific sequence of steps, specific uh, procedure that all those transformations have to go through. And that determines the logic of your facility layout, right? So you plan it 
so as to, to feed with your assembly line patterns, basically. Uh, so this is typically employed for highly standardized products that you manufacture in high quality. A very different approach is uh, when you offer a high variety of products or services uh, and you put the customer into the center of what it is that you do. So uh, this facility layout is called a process or functional layout. The idea here is that the customer, once he or she reaches you, can get access to what that little part of your organization that he or she needs without having to go through all the same sequence of steps that you may be engaged in. So think about the hospital. Um, if as a patient you go there and you need to see an ophthalmologist, it doesn't mean that you have to go through all the medical specialists until you reach the ophthalmologist, right? You just go to where you need to be and just do that, right? So it, it puts the customer in the focus and it provides access to whichever little part of the organization uh, is in charge of uh, manufacturing uh, that part or, or servicing or giving you the service, whatever kind of service you uh, may need. Uh, a third kind of facility layout is the so-called cellular layout. So uh, this one is typically done where a single person within the organization may need access to multiple kinds of operations or multiple processes. If you think about a chef in a restaurant, right, there are different kind of things that he or she may need to grab at different times. Right? So there are products, there are ovens, there's you know, the, the, the cutting surfaces and all the tools and whatnot. So all of that has to be within easy reach. So the workplace is organized to ensure that. If you're an office worker, right, you probably have your desk, you have your laptop, you have your phone, you have your, you know, fax and printer and everything, and everything has to be within easy reach to ensure that those operations are done um, effectively. And then finally, in some cases, we deal with fixed position layout. So this is usually when you have to travel to your customer to perform your operations. And again, the example that the textbook provides is uh, mowing lawns. You simply have to go to where the lawn is. You cannot really you know, have the lawn brought to you. So you have to organize your operations around where the activities are to be performed. So that's that. As a part of managing the operation system, uh, you have to engage in scheduling and routing. Uh, scheduling refers to listing activities that must be performed to accomplish an objective in sequence with the time needed to accomplish each of those. So um, you specify everything that is essential uh, for something to be accomplished. You specify normative times and um, in most cases you specify the order in which those activities should be performed because you know order is essential as well. Once you have that schedule, you may start thinking about routing. That's the path and sequence of the transformation of a product uh, or, or inputs into an output. So, uh, you know, once you have the schedule in place, you may start thinking about your facility layout and, and how things will travel from station to station. So all of that. And um, when you have multiple projects uh, at the same time, uh, an essential part to think about is priority scheduling, right? Which of those projects do you do first? And there are three basic principles that organizations employ. The first one is the easiest one, first come, first served, right? So no other considerations are, are made, uh, so uh, you, it's you know, like when you call some bank and they tell you that they are experience, experiencing a high volume of calls and that your order, your call will be answered in the same order it was received. So that's the example of first come, first serve. You may also try to do, to, to first perform the activities that have the earliest due date. 
right? If you know you have a deadline for this project, but not for that one, you're gonna do this project first. And that is essential, that is very helpful when there are some financial implications for meeting or not meeting deadlines. So uh, you wanna be paying attention to that. And uh, sometimes you also choose to do the operations first that have the shortest operating time so that you get as many projects out of the way as possible before start, starting concentrating on the really complex ones. Um, if you have multiple credit cards, right? The one advice that uh, financial planners often give you is that uh, you know, to pay them off, you first try to pay off the one that, uh, you know, that has the lowest uh, balance. It's not that, it doesn't even matter if the interest rate is high or low on that one, You're just getting it out of the way is, is helpful, it's motivating, it keeps you on track. So many organizations do that. Uh, with respect, with uh, respect to project scheduling techniques, um, three main uh, techniques that organizations employ. The easiest one is the so-called planning sheet. So this one is just a list uh, of, you know, so it has the objective and then it's just a sequence of activities required to meet that objective. When each of them begins and ends, who's responsible, uh, you know, maybe, maybe some checkpoints along the way. So it's, uh, it's not terribly uh, useful, uh, it's not terribly informative, but it gives you an idea what has to be done when and who's in charge. A more sophisticated way is the so-called Gantt chart. So here we talk about bars to graphically represent a schedule and progress towards the objective over a period of time. So here's the example, right? It uh, lists four different projects, um, vertically and then horizontally you have time. And uh, those shaded areas on each of the bars indicate uh, the part of the project that's already been complete. And obviously this, what you see is orange is the part that still needs to be done. So here you at least see whether or not you're on schedule, if some project is behind, if you need to do something, if some project is maybe ahead of schedule, so you may redirect your efforts someplace else. Um, I've seen it used a lot by the European companies. I believe that a lot of American companies use that as well. So uh, that is a fairly useful tool. And then finally, there is this performance evaluation and review technique, also known as PERT. So here, um, this one allows you to show interconnectedness, interdependence of different sorts of activities. And um, it also allows you to identify a critical path towards the achievement of your organizational objective. Right, this critical path, uh, here it is indicated by those uh, double arrows, means that any delay in any of those kind of activities will cause the delay of the entire project. So that you know those critical parts are and you pay most attention uh, to those critical parts. Um, inventory control uh, is something that you need to do if you want to run your operations uh, efficiently. So uh, what we mean by inventory, well, basically it's uh, everything from your inputs to your work in progress uh, to your outputs and uh, you know, as you deliver them to the customer. So they include things like raw materials, right? Or your inputs, something that you have stored in your warehouse. Work in process, uh, these are the inputs that you started working on but the transformation is not yet finished. Outputs has to do with uh, finished goods. And then this delivery to customer goods in transit, this is also something that you are still responsible for. So you have to be really careful planning and controlling each of those four elements if you want the effectiveness of your organization to remain high. And, um, You've probably heard about just-in-time manufacturing and inventory control. 
Well, the idea is, uh, you know, uh, you don't necessarily want to have this great warehouse that will keep you running for six months because it costs you money and, you know, it, the material gets stolen, it gets damaged while stored. So it implies that there are costs to have in large uh, raw material supplies. So, uh, you know, you want to work closely with your suppliers. You want to have a very predictable manufacturing process, a transformation process. You want to be able to forecast your sales accurately. You want to have effective sales function and, and service function so that at each of those four elements, your costs are minimized and, and the opportunity to have decent profits is maximized. So uh, you do that thing uh, by engaging one of the planning material requirement systems. Uh, we may talk about uh, MRP, uh, the so-called material requirements planning. So here you pay primary attention to operations and inventory control, this complex uh, ordering and scheduling system. So you basically try to increase effectiveness of your operations as such, right? So all those steps that you go through and um, you, know, you don't buy more than you need right now and you try to control quality and everything. So that's, that's, that's sort of the nuts and bolts of the planning material requirements. Uh, the more complex system is the so-called enterprise resource planning. It does all those same things that an MRP system does, but it also provides information on the firm's entire enterprise. So here, if you're a sales agent and you have a potential new order being placed, you can put it in a system which will inform all those previous elements in the system so that a tentative order may be placed with one of your suppliers and some um, operation planning may be done at the company. You know, maybe, maybe you need to invite more people for the second shift or something like that. So ERP system allows for that. MRP does not. And then finally, there is this uh, so-called economic order quantity system, uh, which is really uh, how you try to come up with the optimal quantity of uh, some, well, I guess inputs that your business requires based on mathematical modeling. The idea here is that, uh, you know, if you order too much, it's gonna cost you to maintain the quality, to maintain the quantity, to, uh, you know, to, to guard what it is that you have. If you don't order much, but you rather order frequently, this is sort of a good thing, but then frequent interaction, they also come at a cost. So, you know, there are costs to frequent reordering. So finding the balance between these two opposite forces is the essence of economic order quantity and there's heavy mathematics involved in that. You also look beyond just your own manufacturing processes and that's uh, where the idea of supply chain management comes into place. So uh, here you try to coordinate all of the activities involved in producing the product and delivering it to the customer. So, um, right, your, your sales, your transportation, your relationship with suppliers, all of that comes into focus. And um, there are different techniques that you can use as a business to optimize it. They are all fairly complex. Uh, so a newer phenomenon that we started seeing fairly recently is so-called strategic cloud supply chains. This is where you outsource all of those supply chain management processes to a third party. All your logistics is done by someone else. So Amazon does it, FedEx does it, uh, UPS does it. So they don't just deliver parcels. Uh, a big chunk of their business is actually running logistic uh, processes for third parties. 
And then finally, something that has come uh, into play with the development of technologies is the so-called RFID, the radio frequency identification technology. Um, so right when you're in a store, you buy some items, uh, it is scanned, and then the information about the sale of this specific item is transmitted to the manufacturer almost immediately. So it is a real-time inventory control for you know, stores, but the same information also gets transmitted to the manufacturer, to, to the logistics providers, so that the effectiveness of the entire supply chain can increase uh, dramatically. And uh, one thing that is absolutely essential to increase the effectiveness of your operations is quality control. Right? It doesn't really help us much if we can ensure fast throughput if our products are defective. Right? Defects are costly. You remember we talked about damage control previously, so you definitely want to do as much as you can to ensure the highest quality. And the person behind our current thinking about quality is Edwards Damon. So he was an American who came up with uh, a lot of great ideas to ensure in high quality manufacturing. But uh, back in the day, nobody in the States felt like, uh, you know, that was a good investment, a worthy investment. So he went to Japan and taught a lot of Japanese manufacturers how to increase the quality of their products which helped in turn uh, Japanese turn into such an economic powerhouse. Uh, there are many principles there. Uh, I believe he talks about uh, 14 main lessons that companies have to learn if they want to do, uh, if they really want to emphasize quality. But uh, the rule of thumb is that 20% uh, of sort of quality reasons, uh, potential problems, cause 80% of expenses that you have to incur to deal with those problems. So if you identify those typical culprits and you address them first, you can actually reduce up to 80% of all the costs associated with poor quality. So this is something known as a Pareto principle. Um, and um, you know, a lot of companies have come to realize that that is indeed the case. So uh, they try to target those 20% uh, of most likely culprits first in order to increase their effectiveness and satisfaction of their customers. Uh, we also talk about quality assurance, which really implies building in quality in everything that we do as manufacturing company, as a service company. So uh, quality becomes an integral part of our value proposition. So that is essential. And uh, so obviously poor quality is uh, very expensive and many companies went out of business precisely because they tried to save a little bit of money on ensuring quality in their products uh, early on. Um, we have to reward quality because people usually do what they are rewarded for. So keep that in mind. And uh, you've also probably heard about a system called total quality management. Quality management is not limited to just one element of your operations or, or the transformation of inputs to outputs. Uh, there are at least four things that you have to keep in mind. One is you have to focus on delivering customer value, right? You have to understand your customer. You have to understand what the quality means for that customer and, and keep that in mind. You have to continually improve systems and processes to deliver that value to the customer. And um, it turns out that the vast majority of uh, defects and problems that we have, they're not really the result of human mistakes. They are the result of poorly planned processes. So you try to focus on managing processes rather than people. And this kind of flies in the face of a lot that uh, you guys may be taught in some other courses like organizational behavior and human resource management. But uh, if we looking at quality and managing costs and effectiveness of business, you want to focus on managing processes and not people. And then you also employ teams to continually improve, right? So quality is everybody's business. 
so to speak. Uh, there's not just one person responsible for quality, so you have to make it uh, everybody's task. You may also have heard about Six Sigma. The idea here is that uh, you really have to minimize defects as much as you can. Uh, the notion of Six Sigma, well, Sigma is a Greek letter used for standard deviations in statistics. So basically, if you try to follow the Six Sigma process, uh, you basically say that you, know, you can make one defective item out of a million. And it sounds like it's too good to be true, uh, but many companies who have adopted this philosophy seriously were able to improve the quality to the levels where this is actually now a reality. And um, if you do everything right, if you manage your operations correctly, if you manage your people correctly, if uh, you, know, you paid attention in this class and you understand this planning, organizing, leading, and controlling, then you may actually achieve something known as the balance scorecard. So this is when uh, organizations are, they, they, they try to reach four goals at the same time. Financial performance, customer service performance, internal business performance, and then learning and growth performance. All right, so financial performance obviously is very essential. You have to be profitable to stay in business. So that goes without saying, Custom performance, uh, customer service performance is also essential because without customers, without happy, satisfied customers, we cannot possibly talk about our financial performance. In terms of internal business performance, you look at how effective our operations are and whether or not we are doing our best to increase our productivity going forward. And learning and growth performance has to do with continuous improvement, with developing our employees, with uh, increasing the effectiveness of organizational culture, right? So all of those elements that we've covered throughout this class, if you combine them correctly, they would give you this perfect balance in terms of performance, in terms of ensuring uh, customer satisfaction, constant improvement, both in terms of productivity and in terms of you know, people, organizational culture and whatnot. And uh, you know, I hope that uh, you guys will take it seriously. And as you start your professional careers, you will look beyond just operation or just finance or any of the functions that we've discussed and would view your business holistically. Uh, thank you for the great semester. Uh, it has been quite a challenge, obviously, with the coronavirus and whatnot. Uh, I'm actually very impressed with uh, how you guys have persevered through and uh, everything that you've done on quizzes and those assessments and assignments. Uh, I wish you the best on the final exam, and uh, I'll do my best to grade it uh, fast. So, uh, you know, a week from now, we'll be done, and, uh, you know, have a great summer.